All right, we are live on YouTube and ready to go. Once again, this is Neil, W2NDG, beginning the Overlook Mountain Amateur Radio Club's Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. You meet here every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Myself, W2NDG, and Jim, K2BHM, to talk about science and technology. Uh, sometimes we have a subject in advance, and other nights like tonight, we're going to ask our check-ins if they have a subject. So you can find us on the repeater on 146.805 megahertz with a negative shift of 600 kilohertz and a PL tone of 103.5 hertz. You can also find us on YouTube, and that is by searching for W2NDG, that's Whiskey 2 November Delta Golf. Search for W2NDG Science and Technology, and you'll find our live stream. All right. So first things first, as always, let's see if my co-host is there. Jim, K2BHM, are you around this evening? Hi, Neil. Yes, I'm here. K2BHM. Thank you, Jim. And if a topic doesn't develop, I was thinking, one of the things we haven't really spoken about is, uh, is sound. We've talked about we've talked about uh, what it is. It's kinetic energy, really, interpreted by our ears. But we haven't really discussed audio, um, so we could always head in that direction if a topic does not develop. All right, Jim. Any uh, things first and foremost on your mind tonight that you wanted to talk about, or an idea for a subject from you? first part of that I think would be more uh, quantum discussion from a discussion of old uh, yeah um, actions based on the observer yeah no, I think we're good to go on anything that comes up we'll give everybody a chance to uh, uh, throw something out and see what sticks All right, Jim, thank you. So, well, let's get on with some check-ins and start a discussion. To check in to the Science and Technology Net, uh, take a pause, take a breath, and come at me with your call sign, your name, and your location. Please come now. going to tell Jerry, technically, it's Matt's fault, because usually Matt comes before him. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, and a quick net is fine tonight, believe me. I do have things I can do. <laughs> but anyway, let's see if there's anybody else real quick. But I've got Jim, Jerry, Matt, and myself. Anybody else?
Well, a couple more there. And I have to say, Jim, Jerry, and Lou, we are outnumbered by the Kerhonksonites tonight. <laughs> anyway. All right. We can start. Um, like I said, we're kind of open topic tonight, but I did make a rough suggestion about sound and audio. Certainly something that I used to uh, dabble a lot more in than I do now. But um, we can take that in almost any direction. Or if there's something in particular you would rather talk about, let me know. Let's start. Actually, uh, let's start with Jerry. Yes, WA2RKN. all right yeah you know, i have the hf rig going at my right hand here um i'm just watching the waterfall scroll by but i get this pulse noise at night that i have to track down and it does it just has this sign it looks like a battery charging circuit to me from my experience but i've pretty much tried to kill everything around the house one at a time and it never goes away so i think it might be outside of the house <laughs> all right thanks jerry Matt, KB2, GGF. What would you like to talk about tonight? Well, at the risk of uh, saying a terrible pun, audio sounds good to me. Um, that's an interesting topic. Um, and uh, noise. You just made me think um, of the red radios that uh, everybody bought when they were on sale. At least I hope they bought them when they were on sale. Um, the Baofangs, the 9S's, um, excellent noise detectors. It's the only radio, including the uh, UV5R Baofang I have, but the 9S is the only radio in uh, my possession that um, I can use as a noise sniffer. It has very little shielding, so when you bring it near something that might be making noise, you do pick it up. So, another use, but... Um, Back to uh, Ned, I, I think audio is a good topic. Thanks, Matt. And no, I haven't actually noticed that about mine yet. Um, you know, somebody else had asked um, what was the red radio that everybody was buying? You know, was it still available? And uh, when I went and looked, the particular seller that we all bought from for $19.99 or whatever it was doesn't have them anymore. At least they're out of stock for now, but whether it's the same reseller or a different one is offering the same radio, and Matt will get a kick out of this, for $10 more, $29.99, with the uh, inclusion of the, I think, radiotity version of the tri-band antenna <laughs> uh, included in the, in the package. Um, would you have gone for that one, Matt? No, because it was still cheaper for me to get two of the um, useless tri-band antennas. So <laughs> I've got two horse crops back to net. Yeah, I remember. I was just thinking maybe the radiotity one would actually be more useful. All right, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because we have a question from the chat room. Um, and it's Jim, uh, KD2VAH, wants to know what the thing is on the top of the dresser. Well, this is actually a... Not really a dresser, it's like one of these narrow jewelry cabinet things, but I have it stocked mostly with uh, radios <laughs> and ports. And on top of there is this is a self contained uh, Raspberry Pi 4 in a uh, seven inch touchscreen case. And this was one of the stars of my Ham Radio University uh, talk that I did on Raspberry Pi. And it's running something called the Ham Clock, um, which is a really cool app uh, for something you want to have running in your shack. You can do it with a Raspberry Pi or with uh, um, a couple of different uh, microprocessor boards. Um, 
And it's a whole project online. The easiest way, not the cheapest way, but the easiest way to do it is to buy a Pi 4, a 7-inch official Raspberry Pi touchscreen, and one of these 7-inch uh, housings and load it on that. And it works pretty good. I use this this particular, you know, setup for other stuff as well. But usually during the day, I have the hand clock running. So, and it's neat. Anyway, um, back to the list, which brings us to Lou in New Jersey. Uh, what do you want to talk about, Lou? Or do you like the idea of audio? high audio you know i usually just plug in a usb sound card and don't bother to try to deal with uh, the onboard audio at all but um it can get a little tricky um the uh, os can get a little confused as to which uh audio stack it's using um i i can't give any specific recommendations for how to get around it but uh I have run into it myself, and it's just a, a lot of Googling and a lot of trial and error, and sometimes just blowing it away and starting over, uh, which is pretty easy with these things. So let me draw. Um, as far as the soldering station, I pretty much bought one of those ones that you're talking about. Um, I, uh, I picked mine up off of eBay, I believe but it's the same as some of the ones you're seeing on Amazon. I don't know about a lot of people having trouble. I think the overall reviews were fine. Like a lot of Amazon things, you might find, you know, a bunch of people that had a problem. Uh, the good thing about buying it on Amazon from, you know, either directly from Amazon or an Amazon fulfillment um, controlled retailer, you know, on there um, is that you can return it. Um, if you have a problem, you can get, you know, something uh, taken care of um but that's that's what i have i have one of those multi solder stations i bought some better tips for it I and mean, it comes with a good assortment of tips and you can get an idea which ones you like the best and then 
order more of those because it does take the good uh, Heiko tips, uh, which you can also get on Amazon. The hot air, that's what I've been using. It works great. I haven't had any complaints with it. And uh, it's got that power supply and uh, um, uh, voltage uh, checker. It's got a voltmeter on it. So uh, for, for the money, it was fine. And I think if you do Amazon, at least you have that option of uh, sending it back. So let me drop. Um, there's a, all this traffic going on in the uh, YouTube chat. Um, Joe was commenting on the, uh, the Pi terminal here. So, yeah, um, I, I have used it for both WSJTX and uh, FL Digi um, with the uh, Zhigu X5105. And uh, also, um, I did hook it up once to the Micro Bit X as well. Um, but that was more proof of concept. I haven't gotten the audio link working on that yet. Oh, and I used it for the uh, the new Han Summers QDX as well. Um, but I haven't made a contact with that one yet on the Pi, only uh, receiving. Um, but I've definitely made contacts with the 5105 and just using it with my 7300 here in the shack just to make sure it was actually working. Um, yes, yeah, seven-inch screen is a little small for that, but what you can do... Um, is you lower the font size in WSJTX, you lower the uh, the icon and font size in uh, Linux, and you run WSJTX with the menu off, and you get enough screen real estate to actually use it. And it works quite well. And this screen doesn't really soak up a lot of battery power. So, so far, so good. I kind of like it. Um, but as the hand clock, it's really cool. But yeah, if I make my own, I may go with a larger screen. We'll see. And that will be uh, not Raspberry Pi based if I do my own, probably. Make a wall mounted one. There you go. All right. Um, Lou, any comments back before I go to Bob? Uh, no, I guess uh, you answered me on the audio on that. Uh... I saw a couple of YouTube videos where they were talking about using uh, audio cards if you wanted to, uh, I guess, put that kind of speaker on it. Because that's a speaker that's just the, um, everything goes through the USB plug. It doesn't have a separate uh, USB and, and uh, regular audio plug, like some of the speakers do. <clears throat> and uh, the side All right, Lou. And it, it comes under a lot of different names. What I would do is just look for the one that has the common, the the best ratio of number of sales to uh, to rating. I mean, that's usually what I do. And you have to take a lot of it with a grain of salt. You know, as long as you're not looking at a you know a rating down around four or less, I think you're fine. Um, and enough sales. You know, you don't want to order it from a place that has a five star rating that's only sold two of them. And you know all this stuff. I don't have to repeat it to you. <laughs> so uh, further chat comments. Yeah, the HDMI audio is fine through a, a monitor that has it or has the uh, the outputs where I can peel it off. But in this particular use case, no, <laughs> it doesn't really. Uh, there's, there's no way to, to dig into that. So, um, but yeah, I like this. Uh, I like this setup. Anyway. Let's go to Bob, KB2RWW. All right, Bob, we've gone in a few different directions, but let's see. What would you like to talk about? Good evening, Neil, and to everybody else in the uh, in the group. Audio. Oh, that's a deep subject, especially when it comes to radio. Uh, audio is very important, uh, such as uh, if you... Uh, 
have a really uh, low spoken uh, voice, uh, sometimes your audio gain has to be uh, driven up or uh, eventually uh, you start sounding like you're fading off the uh, face of the earth. And then you have other people that uh, sometimes they uh, could be uh, a little hot on the mic and uh, could be over deviating their radio. And then it just sounds like garbage sometimes. So that makes it really rough, especially for some people that have a uh, hard of hearing. Now, uh, as far wise as soldering irons and uh, hot workstations, I have dealt with them for many of years. And uh, although I cannot at the top of my head recommend a particular brand, I will give some of thoughtful insight to what I have observed uh, using them. Some soldering stations, the tip is not grounded. This may be a problem for some people. Sometimes it's not a problem. But when it comes to hot workstations, I have found some hot workstations that were made overseas that the outside shielding is hot. Not so much to the touch as in heat, but is into electrical that uh, the sometimes they tie the neutral or the main to the shield. And unbeknownst to you, you get a little zap from it. It does happen. Uh, there are uh, a couple of uh, different uh, uh, different places on the web uh, that uh, in talk groups that do talk about that, and they point out which ones they are. Off the top of my head, like I said, I don't remember which ones, but uh, yeah, uh, just remember that can happen if you're working on something that requires to be powered up as your. Uh, Manipulating parts on the board, uh, sometimes you don't want a soldering station that is grounded because it will interfere with what you're doing and cause more havoc than you really want. Uh, other than that, uh, I love that little device for the uh, Raspberry. Uh, for me, a little bit bigger is uh, better, but then again, there's other people that would probably go and hook that up to a 60-inch TV. And I'm sure there's probably software out there, uh, judging by what you were running, uh, you're almost mimicking a... Uh we have timed out, folks. Hey, Bob, you timed out. <laughs> Kind of hard to do on this repeater, but I, I'm, I'm a culprit usually myself. Um, let's see. We heard up to um, almost something. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only, we only lost like the last 10 or 15 seconds. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, the uh, last uh, 10, 15 seconds is most likely going to be if you're soldering on something and it's kind of live as you're doing it, you do not want a tip that is uh, grounded because it will wind up wreaking havoc with uh, what you're doing and possibly uh, cause more problems uh, for you than what it uh, you originally started. And that was basically about it. KB to our WW back to that. All right, good to know. Like I said, I have one of those, you know, cheapy all in one uh, soldering stations myself. I, I never work on anything live, though, at least with that. Um, usually, if I'm working on something live, I'm using one of the cordless ones. And, uh, well, the, of course, the, the butane one is definitely not grounded. <laughs> but. Yeah, cool stuff, Bob. Um, and definitely something uh, worth considering. But, you know, now that you've said that, I will make sure, if I ever have to work on something live, that I'm only using the uh, the uh, standalone ones. Okay. So we worked our way through the list. And uh, I've been answering some of the chats here and there. A little bit of a Raspberry Pi discussion going on there, only because I the thing is sitting here over my shoulder. But um, 
I still have to fix the screen timeouts. Unfortunately, some of the uh, parameters that you have to set are uh, not in the usual menus when you use these uh, displays that connect through the headers on the board as opposed to through the HDMI ports. So things get a little funky. So I have to dig into the um, dig into some of the config files and fix it. There's plenty of web pages supporting it. Um, but yeah, right now I think it times out after about 10 minutes or so. All right. Is there anybody else who wants to join us tonight on the radio anyway? Um, please come now with your name, your call sign, and your location. All right, nothing heard. And well, the ID is W2NDG, Neil from Highland. And uh, Jim comments on what we've heard so far. Um, things about uh, the soldering station or general audio talk. And uh, of course, you heard some Raspberry Pi talk as well, but uh, uh, driven by uh, some people in the YouTube chat. <laughs> I'm here for ID. Um, yeah, I haven't played around much with audio on the Raspberry Pi at all, other than um, using a TV set as a monitor, and you can uh, get the audio through the HDMI, so you can play a, a video or whatever and get the audio through. But as far as uh, playing it out someplace else, um, never really went there. Um, had plenty of other things to worry about. And uh, soldering, yes. Uh, Brings back memories. Let me drop a second. Way back in the early or late seventies, my first job was for Trojan Electronics. Um, I did uh, field service on uh, electronic equipment and stuff like that, communications, uh, PA systems, and so forth. And uh, when it wasn't busy, um, I would wind up uh, working on the bench in the back fixing. Uh, Radios, TVs, CB sets, uh, scanners, whatever came along. And there was another uh, friend of my boss that would come in and uh, work every so often uh, uh, working on a backlog. And uh, he had the technique of taking a scanner or a CB set or whatever and turning it on and just going around with the soldering iron and reflowing all the joints until it worked. And I would cringe because I'm thinking, well, either the solder iron is grounded and you're going to uh, uh, short something out and blow the uh, power supply or something, or it's not grounded and you're going to get uh, a AC coupling from the uh, wires from the power going in and uh, overvoltage something and blow it. But uh, amazingly enough, he had like a... 80% success rate, and realistically, what did he care? Because if it didn't work, he just, well, it wasn't repairable, and give it back to you, so. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, enough said about uh, Saturn Live. Um, back to you, Neil, K2BHM. It'd be worse with an old TV. Yeah. <laughs> Especially some of the high voltages there that uh, you wouldn't connect up with the 25 kilovolts, but they had like uh, 900 volts on the uh, second anode and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that was enough to get you in trouble. Good friend of the family. Actually, the first soldering coach I had because I, I you know, learned on my own as a kid from uh, whatever book came with the first thing that I bought and then. I needed help, went down to the street to my uh, one of my older brother's friends, who was quite the engineer. He was telling me stories about some of the things he had built, and he had built one of the Heathkit console TVs for his family. And at some point, I don't think it was during assembly, probably during, during testing or troubleshooting, um, he accidentally touched the wrong thing, and there was a loud crash, and his father... Came downstairs a couple minutes later when, he, after yelling a few times, didn't get an answer and just found uh, Ken laying against the opposite wall, 
from where the TV was, <laughs> just kind of staring off into space a little bit. And uh, he was okay. He recovered. <laughs> but he said he learned his lesson the hard way. Crafters S120 from uh, it was the husband of a, a woman who worked for my parents when they had the business years ago. And uh, when he dropped it off, he was showing me how to use it. And uh, before we even plugged it in, I looked at the cord and the uh, the uh, line cord on it was, was looked pretty new and had like um, you know, tan plug on the end, and there was a bright red line. Um, Looked like you know someone had stenciled on the plug on one side right in line with one of the prongs and i pointed to it i was like what is that and he said that he said that's because i didn't have a polarized plug so when you plug this in that goes to the larger of the two plugs <laughs> and uh i replaced the line cord with a polarized one as soon as i was able to pick one up but yeah all right. <laughs> uh, let's uh, keep going here. We're back up to the top with Jerry, WA2RKN. Anything on what you've heard so far, Jerry? Well, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we've all been baptized by electricity in this hobby. Uh, I, I, remember, I remember having a work on my, uh, my rig. I had a Swan 500. And uh, I, I needed to do something in the, uh, in the transmit tank circuit or something, voltage measurement or something. I, I don't remember at this point. But, uh, you know, I had the, uh, the top off and the uh, cage top for the, the final cage um, and uh, meter leads and stuff. And, uh, you yeah, um, you can't take voltage measurements from the power off. So, uh, yeah, that was exciting. Uh, I was standing about two feet from a wall, and uh, I was thrown very nicely into the wall. 800 volts DC. Um, I was fortunate. Um, as uh, as far as soldering irons, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've gotten bit by that, too. Um, I've got a, a Weller uh, soldering iron, you know, the usual uh, 25, 35 watt. Um and um, I was working on a, um, a um, driver board for some uh, giant Nipsies uh, that I had cobbled together a power supply for. And as you noted, uh, you know, a rectified line they, uh, gives you 170 volts, which is what the tubes needed. <clears throat> and um, I had my Weller iron, and uh, well, I just needed to touch up this one joint. Uh, the, uh, the Nixie display was on, and uh, I discovered that, uh, yeah, I guess the tip was grounded on the iron. Did a nice job of vaporizing the traces on that circuit board, and uh, yeah, I was kind of upset by that, because that was the best board of the, of the bunch that I've got. So, yeah, there is that. Audio. Well, you know, audio is a rich topic as well. Um, ultrasonic cleaners. And uh, as mentioned earlier today in a brief conversation, 
um, the uh, remote re remote uh, speaking to someone in a crowd with the uh, ultrasonic uh, constructive and destructive interference. So you could uh, aim a couple of microwave beams and uh, voila, you get uh, microwave beams, uh, ultrasonic beams. And uh, the interference will give you back uh, you know, baseband audio there. So uh, that's kind of nifty. Um, I don't know, I'm just kind of ping-ponging around here. Uh, I did uh, pick up a couple of uh, transformers. Um, uh. We only lost about 10 seconds again. You picked up a couple of transformers, and then it timed out from there. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of uh, identical transformers to tie the secondaries together to, to make an isolation transformer for the uh, soldering iron. You know, uh, surplus output to your friend. Oh, yeah. That's where you can, uh, yeah, I, I keep that list, all electronics and uh, know, a couple of the other ones. But uh, all electronics frequently is the one I end up uh, settling on. Um, well, thanks for uh, adding to that, Jerry. And yeah, um, what Jerry was talking about with the uh, ultrasonics was um, a technology that um, a guy... Um, who was selling SDRs for quite a while, Kazunori Mira from Japan. Um, and he still has on eBay, I believe, and on his website, he sells one of these um, ultrasonic uh, transducer 3D sound experiment boards, uh, several different versions of it. And basically, um, the theory here, we want to talk audio, is it uh, excites the air by sending interfering ultrasonic patterns to a point in space and by varying frequency and amplitude i believe um, at that point with the uh, interference from the, you know, the the sound source it can modulate the air molecules at that point where everything comes together so you're sending out uh, pinpoint ultrasonic beams they're converging at a point in space and at that point in space you're basically producing sound so it makes the sound come from a point in space that you're not near um, there's different levels of refinement on this with the cheaper versions of it sounding uh, pretty distorted and rough but still readable all the way up to it sounding like somebody is sitting next to you talking in your ear um pretty spooky and uh definitely has some practical uses um and what brought the whole thing up was a book that i was talking about with jerry called uh, damon d-a-e-m-o-n which was a uh um very uh technical book for those of you who like uh it based sci-fi um it's, uh, basically about a very, very sophisticated um, computer program that tries to take over everything. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's a very well-written book. I know it sounds like a lot of uh, psychobabble. Um, it's not. It, uh, almost every technology used in it is something that currently exists. Just put together in a way that is kind of hard to believe, but uh, definitely a good book. So... Um, Joe says, looks like cubic SDR. Yes, it is cubic SDR. I threw the, uh, RTL SDR dongle in the, uh, Raspberry Pi here, uh, which of course I just touched it and it froze <laughs> because the USB is kind of loose anyway. Um, but yeah, that's another thing that it does work with. So, um, and yeah, Bob also commented, commented on it. Jerome, not sure what that is. I would have to look that up, but no, it's cubic SDR. 
Um, I think I'm running one of the uh, um, ham pie distributions comes out of the box with all the apps pre-installed. I think it was the earlier forerunner to ham pie before you started calling it ham pie. Um, but that's where it came from. And it does work if I were to put the sound card in it as well and feed the audio out to a speaker. Um, I'd be able to play it. But well, we won't get into that. We could do a whole thing on that. <laughs> Let me drop. All right. Uh, we're up to Matt again. KB2, GGF. And uh, let's see. We've expanded that on a few of these things, Matt. <laughs> But if you want to continue on audio, that's fine. Well, I was just sort of thinking about uh, what subject I wanted to comment on. But yeah, audio. Um, it's all audio related and ham radio related. I like having remote monitors um, for my HF rig. Uh, and I can hook up a, a Bluetooth um, transmitter and use a Bluetooth speaker. But then I have latency issues. Of course, when I transmit, but um, you know, I can plug it in, plug it out, switch back and forth. But it's uh, I haven't found a satisfactory way of having uh, remote audio capability, or you know, like a a good Bluetooth speaker without latency uh, issues. Um, I guess it's a pipe dream, but uh, <laughs> I wish there was that. Um, back to that KB two GGS. I found, yeah, Bluetooth, um, Bluetooth in Pi Land can be unpredictable. <laughs> um, it's gotten a lot better. The newer, newer versions of uh, Raspberry Pi OS are definitely better with it. Um, but I still feel like I'm fighting with it, and I know what you mean. I'll pull out one of my Bluetooth speakers, which is a, a quick way to get um, audio running out of one of these without fishing my USB sound card out, and. Uh, it just, it'll be stubborn, and I'll have to delete the device in the Bluetooth manager and re-add it, even though I know it's already in there, um, and it should have worked, so strange stuff. Um, and Matt, who you appreciate the frugal things in the shack as well as I do, I'm holding up one of my latest uh, quick creations from the other day. I have this speaker. I was using with uh, that shortwave radio I made, the surface mount one. Um, and it's a speaker I salvaged out of a clock radio that Jill had that broke. That had pretty good audio. Um, it's one of these uh, like metallic diaphragm, um, the rubber surround little, you know, like one and a half inch speakers that you find in these little Bluetooth speakers. And uh, it sounded really good on that shortwave radio. You know, it's just soldered a. Uh, Typical three and a half millimeter connector on it. So, uh, was it yesterday, last night? Uh, I had it hooked up to something. I said, you know, it, it has decent bass, but there's no, uh, it's not in a cabinet or anything. So, I stuck it in and I'm holding it up to the YouTube camera here. I stuck it in a uh, uh, paper towel tube and uh, sealed it in with some painter's tape and uh, put a uh, wad of the paper towel appropriately in the open end so that it is a sealed base chamber. It actually sounds pretty good. Um, it was perfect for the experiment I was doing anyway. So just to comment further on the audio thing, but yeah. <laughs> uh, any further comment, Matt? Well, I like the mini boom tube. Um, you can paint it black and it looks swell. <laughs> but that, that's a good idea. I like that. Um, no, I'm, uh, I'm just swimming along with the fish, so carry on. KB2, GGF, back to net. All right, Matt, thanks. And, uh, Geochron, that's what Bob was talking about. Finest world clock made. All right. <laughs> and, uh. No, that's not what I was running. But the, the first thing that was up was uh, the ham clock. So, which uh, I know you can uh, edit whatever NTP it's working off of, but uh, 
the official project, which is the one made with the microcontroller instead of the Pi, um, I believe there's an option to use a GPS driven time standard on it, which would be a little more accurate. All right. Let's go to Lou, KB2TBS. Yeah, and like I said, I don't remember the brand on the one I got. <laughs> I do know that the, the tips, you know, I noticed off right off the bat that, you know, they worked fine, but they weren't the, the best quality. I ordered a whole bunch of the ones that I think I'm going to use the most. And uh, another assorted pack, but a better quality um, assortment. And uh, so far, so good. You know, I've done some really fine work. I use it with uh, surface mount boards. Um, I've, you know, done as small as uh, 0603 parts with it. You just need really good magnifiers. Um, also, funny you should mention the flash thing. I've done that. I think I've done it twice. <laughs> it's a pretty quick discharge. So, I mean, it goes through you quick. But one of the things that I've always noted, maybe you noticed this too. I'll hand it back to you. But at the contact point, whichever finger actually hit it, there will be one or two perfectly round little white spots where it cooked you. <laughs> ah, that, I don't remember, but then again, you know, like I said, it's probably been, uh, let me see, probably 40 plus years ago, so quite a long time ago. I don't think my memory goes back that far. But uh, all I remember, yeah, uh, sworn I was probably sitting on the floor in a, in a in an Indian prone position, you know, with crossed legs and when I uh, basically just my uh, I guess my head started stopped spinning I would think I was on my knees and just wondering what the hell happened. But uh, I, I, I know I know the feeling with the uh, burn marks on the fingers. I remember years ago I was uh, when we used to work on airplanes uh, always snap the tag, uh, you know, certain hydraulic pumps and stuff like that, just to, you know, you know, work in an environment where I had multiple people on the airplane doing different things. So one of the things you did was tag the, the pumps and nobody turned hydraulics on you and started doing some stuff while you were in the middle of somewhere or had your head inside something. So I remember putting a tag with that really thin tag wire. metal switches and I was wrapping the, uh, the tag wire around it and for some reason I uh, I guess it must have poked in between 
the toggle for the switch and the, the internals of the switch. And all I can remember is feeling this, this stinging sensation across my fingers and, and smelling something. And when I pulled my hand back, I looked at it, I had wire marks going across all four fingers <laughs> in white, where I guess it cinched them. So I know, I know the feeling. I know the, the smell. <laughs> All right, low. And yeah, I think the first zap I got was as a kid, uh, you know, having my fingers slip on an electrical plug. Um, and you remember it <laughs> and you don't do it again. <laughs> Best way to learn. All right. Thanks, Lou. Um, Bob, KB2RWW, uh, anything further on these topics? pasted into the chat. It was actually in QST, uh, October 2017, I guess. And you can grab the article uh, from this web page. But he shows an example. Um, and he tells you how to build it either with a Raspberry Pi or an ESP8266. And it's got a lot of cool options. Um, you know, it shows uh, weather as well, and I'll play with it some more. I want to see if I can get it to uh, pull the weather feed off of my own weather station. I'm sure there's a way to do that. So um, one of the uh, features when it's running is uh, it shows the active um, um, uh, HF beacon network and uh, puts little triangles on the map where the uh, current active beacons are so it has that built in as well and world time uh, propagation stuff uh, solar weather all sorts of uh, great little features so like i said i put it in the chat for you all right let's just see real quick if there's anybody else out there who wants to join us as a late check-in please come in All right, Jim, I was going to throw it to you next. So, um, yeah, and, and you probably want the detailed um, three-step instructions on how to make yourself a paper towel speaker. <laughs> yeah, okay. K2BHM for ID. Um, yeah, several things. Number one, um, yeah, aircraft electronics is a unique thing. Um, Typically, uh, they used 120 volts, three phase, 400 cycles. They went to the higher frequency because you used less iron in the transformers, and uh, why transport all that iron if you don't have to? So that uh, that can wake you up a little bit 
more than uh, the standard 60 cycles. And uh, photo flash, yes, those xenon flash tubes. They take uh, anywhere from like three to 500 volts to kick them over, depending on uh, how big the tube is and how powerful it is. And the older ones, it takes, uh, they uh, hit the tube with a 4 kV pulse to strike it. And so there's a little transformer there. And uh, quite often, uh, there would be 100 volts coming out the cable that connected to the camera because the camera just had uh, a set of dry contacts in it meant to uh, run a flash bulb with batteries. But it would also uh, run the strobe. And uh, they put 100 volts on it. So either one would wake you up and uh, <laughs> slap you right in the face. Let me drop a second. And that brings back some memories. Um, back years ago, back uh, around 1980 or so, working for the federal government, uh, working on uh, the computerized uh, production machines, large milling machines and lathes and stuff like that. Quite often the motors were uh, DC motors uh, working off a SCR pack uh, drive. And they worked right off the 480 volt three phase line. So uh, you were very careful because you did not get a second chance. Um, you were very rigid in your protocols and so forth. Uh, one of the guys one time was uh, on maintenance and just tightening up the connections on the contactors. And he had the power on and the screwdriver slipped off and went between the contact and the sub panel chassis. So it wasn't him connected to the 440. It was the screwdriver and the blade and shaft vaporized, gave him a sunburn and burns on his face and temporarily deafened him for several days. So, and that was just from the side effects of the screwdriver slipping. So you don't want, you don't want to make a mistake like that. And later on, when I was working in x-ray, 120 kilovolts, half an amp, you don't get a second chance there either. So you are very careful about it. And that kind of gives you a different respect for things. Let me drop again. So yeah, there's no connecting onto it and uh, getting thrown across the room. Um, it, it's permanent. Uh, <laughs> ouch. Just like uh, the linemen working up on the uh, high voltage poles for uh, Central Hudson, whatever. Um, they have strict protocols that they follow and uh, you do not deviate. So um, it's very well regulated and for a good reason. So uh, back to sound, ultrasonics. Um, interesting um, corollary back in the uh, uh, 60s. My dad and a friend of his had uh, these speakers, Duquesne Ionovax with a name. Let me drop. So the speakers had your standard woofer in it, and instead of a normal tweeter, um, they had a quartz tube and the quartz tube, um, they would strike an arc inside the tube with a 27 megahertz uh, power supply. And they would ionize the column of air inside the tube. And then the voice coil wrapped around that. And it was that ionized column of air that was your uh, uh, cone, your uh, movable instrument that uh, generated the sound. And so uh, they had responses up into the neighborhood of 40 kilohertz back in the 60s. So anyhow, that's it. Back to you, K2PHM. Thanks, Jim. And uh, Bob KB2RWW is also watching and he added Another shocking thing, never put yourself in the position to getting zapped by the new ignition transformers in automobiles. He says, ask me how I know. <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but he says it's about 30 uh, to 50 kilovolts. Well, that's not fun. Um, 
And uh, yeah, before I uh, throw that to Jim for comment, I'll mention, I haven't done that, but I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, you know, pinched an aging plug wire a little too hard. Oh, Jim, I don't know if you wanted to comment on the ignition. <laughs> uh, the new ones have a tower that goes right down in through the uh, head, down into the uh, uh, spark plug itself. And I don't know how you would do that, but uh, previously with um, the external coils and spark plug wires and stuff like that, no, you didn't want to do that. That, that, that would definitely ruin your day. Survivable. Let's see if Bob wants to elaborate real quick. Sure. Uh, sometimes, yes, you do have the uh, the newer styles or plug on wire. Uh, they are much safer. It, uh, they change that to keep people from uh, zapping themselves, but. Unfortunately, when you're uh, still going around and testing, uh, doing uh, misfire tests and that, sometimes uh, the best thing is just to unplug that coil, but uh, that will throw codes in the uh, computer and tell you that uh, you unplugged it. But if you uh, pull it up out and disconnect it from the, uh, from the plug, uh, it won't throw a code, but it will throw a misfire uh, code, and it, of course it's audible, but uh, also uh, we have habits. Yes, you can test them with a multimeter when they're at a circuit, and uh, if they uh, don't have the right resistance, you consider it bad, but uh, some of us that are El Cheapo, uh, we uh, power them up externally to see if uh, they're actually working and not go by... Uh, a meter reading because sometimes the meters don't uh, work correctly. <laughs> Hazards of the job. I have to say, uh, in my line of work, the most hazardous thing I deal with is probably uh, having to lift a, a um, Dell uh, Precision 7920 fully populated with every drive you can put in it. <laughs> Definitely dropping it would be a hazard as well. But now, I, luckily, I don't get to deal with a lot of voltage. All right. Let's run through the list one more time. Uh, back to Jim for quick comment and then up to the top. Yeah, okay. Luckily, well, it's easier with the newer cars. They uh, tell you what cylinder is uh, misfiring or whatever. So if you clear the codes and swap the coils um, and the number changes, um, it's the coil. If not, keep looking. Good point. All right. On to Jerry, WA2RKN, and we'll make this the final round, folks. Stop here. 
take a little side side trip. Um, in life, going through, I, I had noticed, like in high school, I, occasionally I could run my hands across like a, a metal case, like an aluminum case or uh, you know an iron case, uh, closing equipment, and I could feel some vibrations. I figured, oh, it must be magnetostriction or something. So, you know, it's telling me that it's live. <clears throat> um, I, I also had developed a habit. Uh, I guess maybe something, uh, you know, this is a good procedure uh, as a safety kind of thing. That uh, if I was working on something and it, it's supposed to be not energized, well, there should be no problem taking a screwdriver and connecting that to the ground. Makes sense. Anyway, back to the story. So, the guy I'm working with went off to energize his circuit breaker, and I'm working. Kind of knew that was coming. For those of you on YouTube, I think it'll be a little while before we get the repeater back. <laughs> uh, poor Jerry. While we're waiting, there we go. Short timer tonight? Oh, it's there, but I mean, uh, it's always there, but. Um, yeah, that was a particularly long transmission. <laughs> so, um, you cut out when you said, I always try to write it down. The guy went to work with uh, the circuit breaker. Okay, so he went back to, uh, he went back to energize the circuit breaker for the equipment that he was working on and uh, mistakenly picked the breaker for the machine. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, for the uh, YouTube folks, yeah, you're watching me plug stuff in here while I'm listening and typing. And yeah, I do have the uh, audio actually playing into the uh, paper towel speaker from uh, the Raspberry Pi running Cubic SDR. Tuned into the easiest station for me to pick up, which is WPDH, which I can pretty much pick up on my silverware drawer in the kitchen. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, you know, I've looked at my tools a number of times, Jerry, and wondered how many times the uh, insulated handles saved me from something. Uh, further comment? for that um and you know i'm gonna uh poke around at uh um Kazunori's, um 
ultrasonic stuff again, see how much he gets for the kits. It'll be an interesting project at some point. And I'll let you know what I find. I think I'll send you a link to his stuff if I can still find it. But the SDR that he used to make was um, the Soft 66, he called it. There are a lot of different versions of it. I have one of them. Um, I got, uh, I don't know, but I think the first SDR device I ever bought. Um, a little quirky. <laughs> You know, definitely not a mainstream device, but his later ones were pretty cool. Matt, KB2GGF, uh, final round and comments. Oh, thanks. All, all these um, stories of bang, pow, <laughs> with the electricity reminded me of my very first encounter with that, which um, happened when I was, I, I think I was seven or eight years old. And as a uh, birthday gift, I got a G.I. Joe, and it was the G.I. Joe Radio Man. And he had uh, a backpack radio, and he had um, a little CW key and a uh, headset, the double band, you know, typical military-looking headset that you'd see. And it was miniature, you know, it was G.I. Joe. And it was so convincing to me. I thought it was a real headset. So, being an inquisitive child, I uh, pulled the wires apart, stripped them, and uh, they were indeed made of wire. So I had little bare copper wires. And I said, wow, these really are headphones. I've got to listen to something. So, I plugged them into the wall outlet. <laughs> and they went bang! And uh, that was my introduction to electricity. Thanks, Matt. I'm pretty sure there's a story about my brother Paul um, when he first started playing the clarinet. So we would be talking, it's usually what do they start the kids with the instruments in elementary school in like third grade, third or fourth grade. Um, I'm trying to think of how old he would have been, what year. This is probably when I was a baby or a toddler, um, mid-60s. And uh, he decided, because he had been watching uh, TV and uh, seeing all of these rock bands with their electric instruments, electric guitars and electric basses, and he was going to make his clarinet electric. And he had been working with something where he had like a, I don't know, some, something that he and my father had taken apart because he was trying to, you know, let him learn what was inside of things, a you know, radio or a toaster or something that he was throwing away. And he said, let's take it apart, see what's in it. And he let um, Paul keep some of the parts. And he took the uh, the AC line cord and ran it up into his clarinet and plugged it into the wall. <laughs> and uh, the wires had touched metal somewhere inside or across. And there was just a loud snap, a puff of ozone, and my father yelling that his reading lamp had turned off. <laughs> At least that's the way it was told to me. Anyway, fun stuff. Thanks, Matt. Lou, uh, final words from New Jersey. Like that. No, you don't. 
don't need to do that. If you know what you're doing, you don't need to do that. Okay, so I'm sitting there watching him, and I I remember him twisting the uh, the little twist the uh, the wire twist off, and that both the lightning shooting out and the lights going out, <laughs> and my mother yelling from the kitchen, "What happened to the light?" <laughs> he goes to me, "Don't you say a word." Reminded me of that, but anyways, sure. Like I said, we can go all night with uh, these crazy stories, but uh, they always make us laugh as long as nobody got hurt. But uh, thanks for running a great night tonight, Neil, and uh, thanks to all for uh, great inputs and good stories. And uh, so take care of yourself, and uh, until next Sunday night, or unless uh, we meet on uh, Thursday night on, uh, with Dave. Thanks, Lou. And yeah, last week uh, talking about cold, that was fun. I enjoyed that. A little quick story for me as a kid. Um, you know, I had this uh, work area down in the basement of the house that my father had uh, built out. But before that was even there, I just used to work at my desk in my bedroom. And I had acquired um, parts, you know, an assortment of parts from things that had been taken apart. Um, and I was always salvaging, you know, different electronic parts out of things. But I, I wasn't about to desolder things. Um, but one of the things I had a lot of was little transistor radio speakers. And uh, they come from things I'd taken apart. And I think from a box of them that I bought at some techies yard sale once. But I had a lot of them. And I had an old Ico monoblock amplifier that I used as my kind of homemade audio system before I got a real uh, stereo receiver. And I had made, you know, all the parts of it. I had a speaker I kind of built out of components uh, with a woofer and a tweeter and uh, some help with the crossover from a friend. And, you know, when I was bored, <laughs> I would take the speakers out of the drawer one at a time and hook them up to the Ico amp with some alligator clips and uh, gradually turn the volume up with some music playing and listen to the speaker play, and as the volume got louder, the speaker would vibrate, would distort, it would vibrate a lot. It would dance around on the top of my desk or my workbench, and, uh, and I would keep going with the volume. And we have to remember, you know, when you're feeding all this volume into a speaker, that is uh, electricity. It's modulating, but it's electricity in one form. Um, and as I kept getting louder and louder, eventually the speaker would blow. And once or twice, it blew spectacularly <laughs> and actually had uh, the paper uh, speaker going uh, catch fire once or twice and then getting asked from upstairs, I smell smoke. Are you burning something? <laughs> W2NDG for ID. Over to Bob, KB2RWW.
Okay, thanks, Bob. And I think we could probably arrange like a formal audio discussion one night for the Sunday night. Yeah, there's certainly so much to talk about. Um, so many different directions we can go off in, you know, as, as actual uh, acoustic theory with speakers, um, you know, learning uh, what makes speakers sound a certain way or another way. Um, talking about um, audio frequency versus RF frequency and the relationship between them when you're dealing with uh, waterfall displays and digital modes and things like that, or, you know, looking um, at the WWV signal zoomed in on your radio that has a waterfall display and seeing that the, you know, the particular audio tones show up that many Hertz higher than the center frequency. Um, you know, those relationships are there or, you know, what, ultrasonics are, what they can do, um, what the uh, constructive and deconstructive purposes are for them, all sorts of things. We could definitely get a lot further into it. Let's see if we have any last minute late check-ins though. Um, please come now with a call sign, a name and a location. All right, nothing hurt. I will throw it back to Jim one more time before we close things up for his final comments as well. I just thought I would mention for the YouTube people who have been commenting on what they see in the shack tonight, um, the only other things, you know, visible to you, uh, the radio over here that's been sitting here all night, if anybody noticed that, is one of the uh, XH Data uh, D808s. This is a little uh, DSP-based radio that does uh, sideband and has a nice assortment of bandwidths, which makes it a much more useful shortwave portable for us than a lot of them. And then sitting under it all night was a Raspberry Pi 400, which is currently not plugged in. But that's uh, the majority of stuff here. Oh, we have one more item, which I'm going to bring out. And once again, I apologize for you radio folks who can't see these things, but this is a DAC, D-A-K, MR101 shortwave receiver that was sitting up behind the pie. And I frequently refer to this radio, because you know I love to collect shortwave transistor radios. I refer to this as the worst shortwave transistor radio ever made. And uh, I usually put it on my booth when I run ham fests and such to sell things. And uh, I think I had it down to 50 cents at the last one and it still wouldn't sell. But it doesn't sound horrible. It's just a terrible radio. It wasn't made very well either. <laughs> but anyway, Jim, comments on anything and final wrap up from W2NDG. Thanks, the OK2BHM here. Yeah, um, very interesting on the high voltage transmission lines. Um, yeah, you definitely want to ground them out. Um, even though they're disconnected, um, once you uh, disconnect the load, um, there could be enough inductive coupling or capacitive coupling to uh, make your life miserable. And uh, case in point, on a minor example, um, I had a uh, light timer um, for uh, controlling the lights on each side of the garage doors. And uh, I took the incandescent lights out and put in the new LED lights. And uh, everything looked fine, everything was working great. And then when the lights turned off, they were going blink, 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 blink. There was enough capacitive coupling across the relay contacts that uh, it was lighting up the lights. And as soon as the lights lit up and struck, they extinguished. And so uh, <laughs> you had to have a timer that was LED light capable, so uh, not to forget about that inductive coupling. Let me drop a second. And flashing the 208 to the frame, um, that brought back memories. Back when I was working Trojan Electronics, uh, late uh, 70s, uh, one of my jobs was uh, sound systems, uh, emergency police and fire evacuation systems for the South Mall complex in Albany, four skyscrapers and all the adjoining uh, underground structure and so forth, and the Alfred E. Smith office building, the Capitol, um, and uh, got friendly with some of the electricians, and one of them admitted one time that 
be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> you might get it. <laughs> uh, he had a, a blower motor went bad. 483 phase, probably like a half horse motor or something like that, whatever. And it was up in some cooling tower or whatever. And he decided, well, rather than go all the way back to the uh, job uh, trailer and dig out the drawings and so forth and so on and figure out what sub panel this is fed from and what building and whatever, I'll just short it out with the screwdriver, change out the motor, and then go find what breaker broke later on. Well, he did, and the breaker didn't pop. He fried a half a mile of cable from the sub panel all the way up to the motor, so be careful what you do. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, interesting uh, topics tonight, G2BHM. Yeah, Jim, I, open topic night has been a lot of fun the last few times. Um, been pretty happy with the way it's been working. So I'd like to thank everybody who checked in tonight and also thank our YouTube audience, um, both live and after the fact. I uh, had a couple of contacts from people uh, I haven't heard from in a while who found us on YouTube and uh, wanted to uh, tell us that they've been watching. So. That's pretty cool. Uh, I know we're in a time slot that competes with another tech net down on Long Island, but uh, um, it's, uh, I appreciate the, the comments from down there. So anyway, I think we'll wrap things up. With a little music in the background from the uh, Raspberry Pi and paper towel speaker. Uh, you have been listening to the Overlook Mountain Amateur Radio Club's Sunday night science and technology net held every sunday night at 8 p.m hosted by yours truly neil w2ndg and jim k2bhm you do not need to be a member of the overlook mountain amateur radio club to participate in any of our nets and we do have several of them this net as well as two a day every day and that's monday uh, starting tomorrow morning at 8.35 a.m. and seven days a week is the 8.35 on the 8.05, which is a casual roundtable net hosted by a rotating group of OMARC-affiliated members. Every evening at 6.30 p.m. is the 6.30 check-in net, a similar net to the 8.35, but a directed net, still casual, where hams gather and talk about what they did during the day and uh, reach out if they need any assistance with anything that they're working on. Every Monday night at 8 p.m. is the Undernet or Ulster Northern Duchess Readiness Net, um, a net talking about uh, emergency services and using our ham radio licenses to participate in emergency actions and support other people. Uh, at some point, uh, probably being affiliated with one of the several ham radio emergency communications organizations, but right now just a local net that we use to make sure that people understand the technology that they need to use in the event of an emergency. Every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m., a uh, brand new net, an HF net called the Hudson Valley HF net, I believe, <laughs> at uh, 4.30 p.m. on Wednesdays on 3835 kilohertz for now. Um, usually hosted by Paul AC2UQ, but uh, has had guest hosts the last couple of times. And uh, this is our first HF net we are holding, and uh, it's so far gotten quite popular. So reach out and find us on 3835 uh, Wednesdays at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. And every Thursday night, Club President Dave, K2JLV, hosts the Thursday Night Technical Net, which is more of a ham radio-oriented tech net. Uh, ham radio or computer ham radio related topics. Dave will look for uh, topics in the first round, somebody having a, an issue, question, or something they're trying to troubleshoot. And if a topic doesn't develop, uh, Dave picks a good one for us. And that net usually runs four or five rounds or more well into the night. Uh, very interesting and a lot of fun. Right now, that's the assortment of our nets. Uh, probably uh, one or two more coming at this point. So well, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Once again, I'm Neil, W2NDG, from Highland, New York. And we're going to close out the net now. I'm going to end the YouTube stream when I stop transmitting. But as usual, I'll hang out for five or ten minutes in case anybody wants to chat. 
Everybody have a good night. And 7-3, we return the repeater to its regular intended use. <laughs>